Hi, my name is Effie Nicky, and today we're going to finish up Chapter 15. We're going to talk about the ear, hearing, and equilibrium. Uh, before we start, we'll talk about the three parts of the ear. Um, just basically get an idea if I say ex external, middle, or internal, you know what I'm talking about. So external, that's the outer part of the ear. Internal, I'm sure you can figure out by now, is the inside of the ear. And the middle is the space in between the two. Uh, what's interesting is the external ear all the way through to the internal ear is involved in hearing, but just the internal ear is involved with equilibrium. And we'll look more at these in just a few minutes. So here's a picture from your book, 15.25. You can see the external ear, you can see the middle ear, and the inner ear. Um, what you notice about the external ear, hopefully we remember our elastic cartilage we talked about way back in the beginning of the semester. What's special about elastic cartilage, it has a recoil, so I can push my ear down and it snaps back because of the elastic cartilage. Um, you notice at the bottom part of the ear here, our ear lobe, you can see that it's mostly made up of fat and epithelial or integumentary uh, skin, basically, and fat. Um, the middle ear, we'll talk about in just a moment. Hopefully, we touched basically whoever your teacher was on some of the bones that are involved um, in the ear. Uh, especially here in the middle ear, um, may or may not have talked about them, but we'll go over them again, the malleus, the incus, the stapes. And then we have the internal ear, and this is actually a bony labyrinth that's inside your temporal bone, and we'll take a closer look. So let's look at the external ear. It's actually called the auricle. Sometimes you'll see the word pina, same thing. Um, it encompasses two things, a helix and a lobule, lobule, either way. This is your ear lobe, this is your lobule, the top part is your helix. Maybe I should get the pen out and, instead of pointing on myself the whole time. Okay, so obviously this is the lobe, this part here is the helix. Uh, external acoustic medius. Normally people call it the auditory canal. Um, that would be this section in here. And we're also going to have an auditory tube later, so please make sure that you're paying close attention to this. So this is the auditory canal. What's inside the auditory canal? Well, there is skin, so this is an epithelial tissue layer. Um, it's also going to have hairs in it. We're going to have sebaceous glands to provide oil for those hairs. Uh, we also have a modified sweat gland in our ear, ceruminous. We'll see that in just a moment if you weren't worried about the spelling. I think I have it in here. If I don't, you can look at it in your book. Um, this actually produces earwax. Um, the main purpose of earwax is to stop foreign objects from getting in, to repel pests. We don't want pests getting into our inner ear. Uh, and even though it's part of the middle ear, I'm going to just briefly show you because it's here in the picture. So the line, the separating line, this would be external and this would be middle. But this object right here is called the tympanic membrane. We often think of it as our eardrum. But for anatomy, of course, we have to have bigger, better words. So it's actually the tympanic membrane. And it is the boundary between the external and the middle ear. And this, we're going to see, actually vibrates. It's like a drum. That's where the name comes from. Um, and it'll actually vibrate in response to sound. OK, so let's talk about the middle ear, and then we'll look at a picture again. So what is it? It's a small, air-filled, mucus-lined cavity in the temporal bone. Um, there are three small bones. We already just mentioned these, the malleus, the incus, the stapes. Sometimes they'll be called the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. If you remember those, I think grade school or high school, sometimes they use those words. Um, we also have here the auditory tube. So we'll look at the difference between an auditory canal, which is outside, and the auditory tube, which is inside. It actually connects the middle ear to the naso pharynx. Um, this fun word right here, pharyngotympanic auditory tube. I like auditory tube a lot better, right? Um, what does this do? What's the difference? We'll look in just a second, but you have the auditory canal, then you have the tympanic membrane, and then you're going to have the auditory tube. And this is actually this auditory tube can actually equalize the air pressure between the middle ear and with the external ear or external air in the environment. Let's look at another picture, I think, coming up that will help a little bit more. Good. 
So in here I have the Malleus, the Incus, the Stapes. Uh, I have them all highlighted for you. The tympanic membrane you can see here. Here is our auditory tube. Here's our auditory. Of course things are not going to work out right, right? I hit one too many buttons and that's what happens. Okay, so here you see your auditory tube. Um, and what I was trying to say about equalizing pressure, if this is your external ear and this is internal, this is your auditory tube and this is the canal out here and I'd have to draw it, right? It's not really drawn. Um, when you're on an airplane and you hold your nose and you swallow or you yawn and you hear that popping, that's actually equalizing the pressure between your internal environment and your external environment. If the um, pressure is not equal, external and internal, when a sound wave comes in, and we'll look at what that is in a second, but as a sound wave comes in, it'll be distorted if the pressure is not the same. So sometimes if that pressure isn't equalized, like you're on the airplane, all of a sudden you can't hear so well. Somebody's sitting right next to you and you can't hear what they're saying. You hold your nose, you swallow. Uh, normally this internal tube is flattened, and when you swallow or yawn, it opens, and then it can equalize the air pressure between the internal and external environment. Some other things to notice here we'll talk about in just a second, but I wanted to show you the oval window and the round window. These are actual entry and exit points for sound waves. So the sound is going to come in through the auditory canal. We'll see the process of how this happens and eventually it's going to go through the oval window into the cochlea which is the organ of hearing and it would come out the round window. Okay. This picture is from a different book. Uh, I put it in here because I want you to actually see that this is embedded in the temporal bone. So when we say bony lab labyrinth, ooh, I can't talk today, bony labyrinth, that's what they mean. It's a maze and it's inside bone, your temporal bone. So you can see here in the picture, the you can see the ear or the oracle. You can see the auditory tube, not the canal. And then you can see the structures that we're gonna look at in more detail. Um, there are three parts in here, the vestibule, the semicircular canals, and the cochlea. And we just saw a picture of the cochlea. We'll see another one coming up. Uh, pretty much these are a series of membranous sacs that are in this bony labyrinth, and they're filled with fluid. They're either filled with a perilymph or an endolymph. Uh, perilymph has the consistency of cerebral spinal fluid, and endolymph has the consistency of intracellular fluid or fluid that's on the inside of the cell, high potassium. Hopefully we remember that. Okay. So now let's look at the internal ear in a little different view. That was just to show you where its location is in the temporal bone. Now let's look at these different structures because, of course, we're going to talk more about them. So we said vestibule or vestibular apparatus. So here you can see the vestibules. That's this part and this part right here. Um, vestibule storage. You can also see here semicircular ducts here and here and here. So there are three semicircular ducts. And then lastly, we have our organ of hearing, which is our cochlea. Some other things to notice, you can see nerves here, vestibular nerve, facial nerve. Um, is there anything else I want to talk about? Oh, spinal organ of corti. Uh, usually now we leave off the corti part. We're trying to get away from eponyms or, or things being named after people. So you'll hear it just called the spin spinal, spiral organ. So the spiral organ is the receptor that actually allows you to hear, but it's housed in the cochlea. So we'll talk more about those in just a moment. Okay, just to recap, again, here's our external ear, our middle ear, and our internal ear. I would make sure that you know um, the parts of each of these. So if I said the malleus is in the external ear, you could say, no, that's not true, or choose false, or not choose it as one of the answers for your uh, multiple choice. What we're going to see here is how sound is generated. So sound, oh... This pen just gets me some days. Okay, so sound is going to enter through the external part of the ear. 
It's going to reach the middle ear and vibrate that tympanic membrane, which is going to vibrate these ossicles or bones of the ear. And then eventually that's going to generate sound. So the cochlea here is the organ of hearing, along with the spiral organ. Before we talk about that in more detail, let's just look at some of the properties of sound. What is sound? If you had to give a definition of sound, could you? A pressure disturbance of alternating high and low frequencies produced by a vibrating object. Uh, sound wave moves out in all directions and usually has an S curve. So let's look at some of these pictures that your books provided. Um, you can see here, you can see here uh, this tuning fork has been hit with an object. What is that causing? It causes all of these molecules that were in this area to be pushed into this concentrated area. We call that high pressure area. They're compressed air molecules. And then these molecules that were right here all get pushed into this high pressure area. So this can actually generate what we would call sound waves. And you can see them here in the picture. A wavelength is from one wave to the next. Amplitude is how high the wave actually is. So another picture here, what's the difference between pitch and loudness? Pitch is pretty much saying how many um, waves are being generated. So you can see in the red picture here we have, let me get the pen, you can see we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have six waves, six sound waves are being propelled. Whereas in the blue we have one, two, three. So that's pitch, the frequency of the waves. Uh, down here at the bottom you can see loudness or amplitude. Um, amplitude is perceived as loudness. Amplitude was the height of our wave. Um, depending on the height of the wave, we'll see why that makes things louder or not, but that's what we would call loudness, how loud something is. Okay, so transmission of sound to the internal ear. Sound waves, I'm just going to read from the slide, but I'm going to show you the picture as well. So sound waves are going to vibrate the tympanic membrane. We already talked about this. So here come the sound waves. What are sound waves? Air molecules that have been compressed into high pressure areas and low pressure areas. So the sound waves are going to vibrate this tympanic membrane. What is that going to cause? It's like a chain reaction. It's going to cause these uh, ossicles or bones in the ear to vibrate. That's going to cause pressure at something called the oval window. Well, this was in the other picture, that's why I wanted to show you because they don't have it labeled here. So the oval window is where the sound waves um, enter. And remember we said in the cochlea it has fluid inside. It has that perilymph and endolymph. Well, what happens if a burst of air hits fluid? Or what happens if um, an object hits fluid? It creates waves or movement, right? You skip a rock, you can see the ripples in the water. It's the same kind of effect here, that the pressure is causing the perilymph or the endolymph to vibrate. And we'll see how this is going to turn into actual sound. So pressure waves move through the cochlea. This is the cochlea. It's not a great representation, right? We said it's a snail shell. We saw the picture before. This is showing you one part of it. It's kind of a sagittal section. Okay, so let's talk about the actual organ of hearing, the cochlea. So that is the snail-shaped object in front of us. So right here, this is the organ of hearing. It's spiral, it's conical, it's bony, it extends from the vestibule. So this is the vestibule. It's divided into three chambers. Um, we're not going to worry so much about the chambers. I know it's the end of the semester. I just look at the names. I'll show you um, an enlargement in just a moment, but it plays a role in talking about the parallels and the epic in the length and how they actually um, vibrate and cause hearing. And in the cochlea is the spinal organ. Remember, we that in conjunction with the cochlea, and these vibrating fluids actually produces sound or produces a signal to go to our brain that tells us we're hearing something. So this is an enlargement of the cochlea. What did they do? They took a sagittal section. They took one sliver out of it so that you could see these three chambers. So remember how I said we had three chambers. 
So here's one chamber, here's the second chamber, here's the third chamber, and they're filled with that fluid. We see perilin, we see indolin. So what's actually happening is this fluid, this fluid is being vibrated or the sound waves are vibrating or causing vibrations in the fluid and that is going to generate sound when you look at this organ right here, which is the spiral organ. So I have another picture coming up. But you can see something here that should look familiar to you. What do we have? We have a nerve, and we have a nerve going up and synapsing with certain kinds of cells. If you've noticed, a lot of times we've been talking about cells with cilia. We're going to see that again. So here's another enlargement. What did I enlarge? I'll go back one for you. What did I enlarge? The circle here in blue. The spiral organ of cortex. So all I'm doing is enlarging that so we can actually see the hair cells, hair cells, supporting cells, and get a better idea of what's happening here. So here is the, get the pen working again. Here is the basilar membrane right here. This is the bottom in basilar basement membrane. This is um, supporting the supporting cells and the outer hair cells. So we can see here the little hairs. We know it's a cell because we can see the nucleus. And what do they do? They synapse with neurons. Again, this should be pretty familiar to us by now after the last two sections of chapter 15. On top of it is something called a tectorial membrane. It's kind of a, a, a membrane. It's made up of connective tissue, but it's almost like a ceiling. So we have a basement and we have a ceiling. The basement is the basilar membrane. The ceiling is the tectorial membrane. And then in between, we have these cells, hair cells, with cilia on top. So what do you think is going to happen? We've seen kind of similar things before, right? What's going to happen eventually is the vibrating sound waves are going to vibrate that fluid that's underneath. Remember in this picture we have uh, perilymph down here and here we have endolymph. So it's going to vibrate that fluid and that fluid is going to cause the hairs to get pushed up to the ceiling. What's going to happen when the hairs touch the ceiling? They're going to bend and that's going to generate a signal. So let's take a look at that. So transmission of sound to the internal ear. Vibrations from the ossicles, so we're starting at those, that point. So here at the ossicles, vibrations from the ossicles go through the cochlear duct, this part here, vibrating the fluid in the chambers. And remember inside here is where you're gonna actually see the basilar membrane or the spiral organ of cortine. It's gonna cause the basilar membrane of the spiral organ to vibrate. So that basilar membrane, that plate underneath that has the hairs, the hair cells, and the cilia on top of it. So what happens, how do the cells get excited? How do the hair cells, excuse me, get excited? Well, we know this picture, we saw it just a moment ago. The cochlear hair cells, they're called stereocilia are stimulated by the vibrating fluid in the chambers underneath it. And then again, we have above it our tectorial membrane. So hopefully we're catching on here about what's gonna happen. This is vibrating. Here's the basilar membrane. Here's the tectorial membrane. And then here we have our tiny little cilia and the cells. And what do they synapse with? A nerve. When those stereo cilia bend, that's going to trigger um, a mechanical action. Uh, if you want to know specifically, there's a lot of calcium and calcium and the fact that this causes a great 
solar membrane to move or vibrate. That's causing these cilia to be pushed up into the pectoral membrane. And when that happens, this hair cell releases a neurotransmitter glutamine. It synapses with the cochlear nerve here, and that's going to generate an action potential that's going to be sent to the brain. Um, this is the picture from your book. Hopefully you can follow along with this picture now. Um, I don't care so much if you follow the words that are highlighted in blue here. If you realize the step-by-step -step process of how hearing um, an action potential is actually generated, how do, we, how do we go from sound to an action potential? If you can do that, you should be able to answer any questions that uh, the department puts on the test, no matter who your instructor is. So basically, I'll go one more time. So here we have sound waves. The sound waves are coming in through the auditory canal. Not tube, right? Auditory canal. That's going to cause the tympanic membrane to vibrate. That's going to cause the ossicle to vibrate, or the bones of the ear. That signal is going to be travel through the oval window, or the pressure from the sound. Remember the high pressure areas. The pressure is going to make the endolymph, or perilymph, vibrate, or the fluid in the chambers of the cochlea vibrate. Inside here, we would be able to see, if we could open it up, we could see the basilar membrane. So if, if the vibrations are coming up from underneath, the basilar membrane is going to move. What's on top of the basilar membrane? The hair cells with cilia. And then what's on top of that? What's the ceiling? The tectorial membrane. So as the basilar membrane is moving, the hair cells are going to move. They're going to hit the tectorial membrane, and it's going to cause them to bend. That's going to cause that hair cell to release a neurotransmitter, glutamine, and that is going to be picked up or synapse with the cochlear nerve, and that's going to send the message to the brain, creating it has action potential, right? Remember neurons and action potential. Create action potential, send the message to the brain so your brain can decide what to do. Oh, and my favorite part when we talk about auditory pathways to the brain. Um, what's interesting is both of your ears, the, the sounds from both of your ears go to both of your primary auditory cortexes in the cerebrum. So here's your primary auditory cortex in the temporal lobe. Remember this part's your cerebrum, but right here is where they're talking about. So both ears go to both auditory cortexes. Um, you can see how many different neurons it has to synapse with, which is kind of interesting. So here's our original nerve. It synapses in a ganglion. Hopefully we remember a ganglion. Then it has to go to the medulla oblongata, synapses here and here, through the midbrain, synapses once again in the thalamus, and then eventually to the primary auditory cortex. Um, trying to think if there's anything interesting I want to tell you about this besides that. And I guess not, so we'll move on. Um, just interesting that both, oh, muffling, that's what it was. I knew I had something to say. Um, how is it that we, um, when you talk, you sound one way, but if you hear something that's been recorded and it's your voice, you're like, wow, that doesn't sound like me, that's weird. Your brain actually has the ability to muffle the sound of your own voice. The purpose for this would be so that you can hear other things. If all I can hear is my own voice and it's super loud in my head, I may not be aware of the giant bear that's coming to get me, right? So muffling your voice actually is uh, an evolutionary um, adaptation. Uh, I didn't show you the picture, and I can go back, but it'll show all the writing that I've done, so I won't. Um, remember how we had the uh, malleus, the incus, and the stapes, the ossicles, the bones of the ear? Well, they're actually attached by ligaments. We had ligaments. If you want to go back and look at the picture in your book, feel free. There are also muscles. So we also have uh, muscles attached to these bones. Remember, most bones, skeletal bones, have muscles, and these are skeletal bones. Um, or that didn't make sense. You know what I meant. <laughs> bones of the skeletal system. Um, so these muscles, the brain can send a signal to the muscles to contract. And when the muscles contract, they stop or dampen the ossicles from vibrating as much. So if the ossicles aren't vibrating as much, the signal that goes into the cochlea isn't as large. So having the muscles contract dampens or stops the ossicles from vibrating, which reduces the amount of vibration that will happen in the cochlea, which then will sound, the sound will be less or lower or um, not as loud. 
Okay, let's see if I can get it together for the second half of this. Equilibrium and orientation. Um, so everything we talked about so far has just been hearing. How do we turn sound into an action potential? Now we're going to talk about equilibrium and orientation. So we'll look at some basic definitions here. What's equilibrium? It is coordination, balance, and orientation in space. Um, vestibular apparatus consists of equilibrium receptors in two areas, the semicircular canals and the vestibule. We will talk about both of these in detail. So here's just basic definitions. Vestibular receptors in two chambers, saccual and utricle. We'll see both of these. So we talked about the vestibule. We said there were two vestibules. We're going to talk about these chambers, the saccule and the utricle. These are responsible for or monitor static equilibrium. Um, static equilibrium is your orientation, where you are in space. They also monitor linear acceleration. So linear acceleration would be if you're in a car and it stops, that forward jerking motion. Uh, linear acceleration will also be in the elevator. When you go up in the elevator and down in the elevator and you feel that um, kind of bump or bounce, um, that would be linear. So the vestibular receptors are also responsible for linear. The second type of receptor here listed is semicircular canal receptors. There are three semicircular ducts. Um, they have something called creased in them, we'll see in just a moment, and these monitor dynamic equilibrium of motion. So I put in little parentheses to help you kind of remember these. Dynamic equilibrium is angular motion, so spinning motion. Okay, so let's look at the picture again. We've already seen this a million times, so we're going to look at it one more time. Oh, come on, pen. Okay. So we're not going to talk about this because we've already talked about the cochlea. We already know about hearing. We're going to focus on this whole section here, which is going to have something to do with equilibrium. So here are the semicircular ducts. Inside the semicircular ducts, they have something called creste ampullaris. Creste for short. Most people say creste. This is going to have to do with um, angular motion, and we'll look at that second. The first thing we're going to look at are uh, vestibular receptors. So here are the utricle and the saccule that are inside vestibule. We call them vestibular receptors. So I'm talking, I'm going to use a different color. I'm talking about this area and this area. Those are vestibules. One is the utricle, one is saccule. We're also going to talk about macula or maculae, these spots right here and here. This is where we're actually going to um, focus on in the next slide. This is where we're actually going to see that static equilibrium and, and how we detect our orientation. Okay, lots of words. We'll get to the picture in a second. So. In the macule of the utricle and the saccula, they each have their own, they each have one, um, sensory receptors for static equilibrium, orientation. Um, they monitor the position of the head in space. So if your head's to the right, to the left, up, down, however. Um, they respond to linear acceleration, like I said, but not rotation, so linear, for, forwards and backwards, up and down. They have cilia. Oh, surprise, right? We have stereocilia and we have kinocilia. These are embedded in a membrane, an otolithic membrane. Some of these words I know. And they have studded in them otoliths. I always think of this as jello. Jello with pieces of fruit in it. So the otolithic membrane is jello. And strawberries and bananas and whatever fruit you put in your jello, those are otoliths. They're ear stones, is what they're technically called. So let's look at the picture and see how all this comes together. The otolithic membrane, the otoliths, and the stereocilia, and then the other type of cilia, kinocilia. Here's our great picture. Um, I like how they put off to the side here to remind you again where this enlargement is. Oftentimes it's an enlargement of enlargement of enlargement, and we forget where we started. So here is the macula of the utricle, macula of the saccule. saccule. So here's one, here's the other, here's the actual macula, the spot. Macula means spot. Um, so they enlarged it so we could see. Here are our hairs, and they're coming off of a hair cell, right? 
and they're synapsing with a nerve. Oh, surprise, right? We're not going to get into the difference between the kinocilium and the sterocilium. There are differences if you want to read them in your book. For us right now, they're just hairs that are going to obviously be bent and cause some sort of action potential to be created in one of the nerves, right? So here's our jello, our otolithic membrane. Here are the jello fruit pieces, <laughs> otoliths. Uh, supporting cells, we can see it sits on a uh, epithelial membrane. And here we have the vestibular nerve. I didn't mention it before when I talked about the cochlea, but you have cochlea nerves and then you have vestibular nerves and then they both merge together. Uh, vestibular cochlear or cochlear nerve, uh, nerve 8, I believe. So these two merge together. Okay, so let's actually look at the picture. It makes a little bit more sense. The bending of the stereocilia. We've already seen this pattern before. So the bending of the stereocilia. What's going to happen? You can look down here in this picture. I think this is pretty uh, clever. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see the hairs there, the stereocilia. And the otoliths, they're showing you the little square white pieces or diamond-shaped white pieces. Those are the otoliths or the stones or the fruit in your jello. What happens is if you move forward and then you stop all of a sudden, all that otolithic membrane and those otoliths sit back. They rush back, right? So you, all of a sudden you're going forward and you stop, they're going to slosh back. When they move back, that's going to cause the membrane, excuse me, that's going to cause the uh, stereocilia to bend. When the stereocilia bend, what's it going to do? Depolarize the hair cell, release a neurotransmitter, generate an action potential that's going to travel along the nerve to the brain. And so your brain can be informed of your changing position based on which stereocilia are being bent. So if you're straight, looking straight ahead, you're not tilting your head either way, your stereocilia are straight up, no action potential is going to be created. But when you move your head to the side, the otoliths shift to the side, that bends the stereocilia, and that causes an action potential to be generated. When you move to this side, what does that do? Well, now all the otoliths have shifted this way, and that's causing the stereocilia to be bent and create an action potential and tells your brain, okay, now the head's this way because these stereocilia were bent, whereas if I'm this way, the ones on this side were bent. It's a little more complicated than this. I'm breaking it down as, as little as possible. Again, end of the semester, a lot of material already ahead of us, so I'm just touching on the basics here. All right, so now we get to move on to rotational or dynamic equilibrium angular motion or angular acceleration. You might see that in your book. Um, so we're going to look at the criste ampullaris. I'm going to say criste for short, but you should know both words. Um, again, they're nice. They show you a picture of exactly what they're talking about. There's one ampule in each of the semicircular canals. Um, each criste has supporting cells and hair cells that extend into something called a cupola. It's a cup. So you can see here the cupola right here. This is the cupola. This entire thing would be the criste. And we can see hair cells and uh oh, guess what? We can see them synapsing with a nerve. So we kind of know what's going to happen, right? This cupola, they're in gel-like strands almost. So we have strands coming up here. And what do we have over here? Endolymph, fluid. So what do you think is going to happen when the fluid is moving? If the fluid is moving, the cupola is going to move. If the cupola moves, it's going to cause the cilia, the hair cells, to bend, and that's going to cause a signal to be created. So that's exactly what I have here. The criste respond to changes in velocity, rotary head movements. We'll see a picture in just a moment. It bends the hairs of the criste. They can depolarize the cell. They release a neurotransmitter because they synapse with a vestibular nerve, creates an action potential, and sends that message to the brain. This is a nice picture. They're showing you the actual movement of the, the flow of the endolymph. They're showing you the cupola, and they're showing you how the hair cells get bent. Um, we're not going to go over all the words at the bottom. I just want you to look at the picture and get an idea of what's going on here. Okay, so we see the cupola is here. This is all endolymph. 
If the endolymph is vibrating, that's going to cause an endolymph, let me say this right, endolymph. If you're moving in an angular motion, what's happening to the endolymph? It's moving that way. If the endolymph is moving, those vibrations are going to go to the cupola, and that's going to cause the cupola to do what? To move in an angular motion. If the cupola is moving, what is that going to do to the hair cells? It's going to cause some of the hair cells to be bent as the cupola is moving around. They go this way, that way, back and forth, right? That's going to generate an action potential in a nerve. Um, the only thing they don't have here, and they don't mention in your book, what's kind of interesting, there's a difference, or I guess I should pose a question. You ever gone to a baseball game and you see the, they have the spinning game where they have the baseball bat and the guy puts his head on and he spins and he spins and he spins, right? And then he stops and he can't find his way back to his seat. He's fallen down, fallen over. Now we have this picture here showing you an ice skater. And what's the ice skater doing? She goes into those death spins, as I call them, right? And then she stops, and then she skates and does a triple whatever, and she's fine. So what's the difference? It has to do with the speed at which that endolymph is moving. Eventually, if you're spinning fast enough, what you can do, put the pen down, what you can do is the hairs are here, the cupola is here, and instead of the cupola bending this way and causing the hair cells to bend, Eventually, the cupola, if you're spinning fast enough, the endolymph is vibrating, but the cupola will almost hover because you're spinning so fast it doesn't have time to fall over to the various sides. So it almost just hovers. So it doesn't give them the disorienting effect that it would if you do it at a slower pace. So just a little FYI. Again, my favorite part, equilibrium, equilibrium pathway to the brain. It's like my mouth's not working fast enough today. Um, we have here three receptors that send information about your state of equilibrium to the brain. So we have the vestibular receptor. The pen. We have a vestibular receptor. That is the creste, the, the cupola, the bending of the hairs. That's where that information is coming from. Um, we have visual receptors, your eye. And then we have somatic receptors. Remember, we have proprioceptors. Um, which tell your body uh, orientation or uh, in space. Um, we also have uh, muscle spindle fibers that tell the length in, of the muscle. So we have somatic receptors, we have visual receptors, and then we also have vestibular equilibrium receptors. Um, what's interesting is that they have two pathways, and we'll talk about one and two. So the first one is they go directly to the brain stem. Here would be for reflexes. We don't want to send all this information to the cerebellum and then decide what motor action we want to do. If I'm spinning and I'm about ready to fall over, do I want to have to waste time to go through the cerebellum pathway? No. I want an immediate stereotyped response. If I'm falling this way, I want my muscles to bring me back upright. So reflexes play a part here um, in the brain stem. There are reflex centers. All this information can go to the reflex center and tell your body what to do. The second pathway is to the cerebellum. And what I just said is true. It coordinates muscle tone, so uh, muscle coordination. So if you're falling over, you might have a reflex to pop back up, but then uh, you realize that you're putting too much weight on one leg and that's why you almost fell over. So what does your cerebellum do? It adjusts your weight and puts more weight or, or contracts the muscles to put more weight or take more weight off of the other side. So helping you with balance and coordination, muscle tone, muscle action, all of those things. Now I get to talk about my favorite thing, which is motion sickness, which I have terribly. Um, it's interesting because they still don't even know why exactly. Um, so I'll just write it up. This is just FYI stuff that I think is fun. Motion sickness. The book gives a great example of if you're in a cabin, like you're on a cruise ship and you're in a cabin, what do your eyes see? Remember, we have visual receptors. Your eyes are saying, I'm in a cabin in a room somewhere. Most rooms are not on the sea, right? They're in a house. So your brain, your eyes are telling your brain, I'm in a room. Your vestibular receptors are feeling the waves of the ocean and saying, we're moving. So this disconnect or this crosstalk between both your visual receptors and your vestibular receptors, your brain doesn't know what to think. Your brain's like, somebody's lying. I don't know who, but somebody's crazy. Somebody's hallucinating. 
maybe there's a drug involved and again this is a theory let me state that they have not they don't really know for sure but the going theory is that um, your brain doesn't know who to believe thinks that one of them might be hallucinating remember when I talked about the tongue and tasting things that were bitter what's one of the things if you get a toxin in your system you're gonna gag um, you're going to feel nauseous you're going to vomit to try to get that toxin out of your system well they think that your brain doesn't know who to believe thinks one of them's crazy and so therefore induces that nausea vomiting effect because something must be wrong that we're getting two different messages anyway I think it's cool hopefully you think it's interesting and uh, thanks for your time I'll see you next lecture bye